Hi, my name is Katrina Finkelstein, and this is my virtual presentation of On the Front Lines of Cosmetics, a tube of lipstick, and World War II for the Eastern Michigan Graduate Research Conference. This is an artifact study done in E. McClung Fleming's model, which requires the identification, evaluation, and explanation of cultural significance and interpretation of an artifact. The artifact chosen for this study and pictured here was a tube of lipstick that is currently in the collections of the Holocaust Memorial Center Zuckelman Family Campus. It was acquired in August of 2018 by librarian and archivist Fago Weiss, and it was used as a facsimile in an exhibit. Now I'm going to be rather brief in the identification and evaluation sections because the cultural significance is, well, significant. So with the identification, we begin with the function. It's very clearly a tube for cosmetics, and in its design, it's very simple, as you can see with its image on the left, in comparison to the much more ornate designs on the right. The material is a metal, some sort of coated metal, because I could tell from the scratches on it that it was not a gold or brass color all the way through. Its construction has a lever to lift the lipstick, which indicates that it's older because it does not have a swivel twist tube that came later. And then its history, which was difficult to know because there was a limited provenance for the item as it was bought off of eBay. Which then brings us to its evaluation, comparing it to other items of its era. Like I said, it was difficult to find a match for this tube. It had no label or maker markings, just some residue on the bottom where I think a label may have been affixed. That being said, there were many ads that had similar cases, like the Tangi one here, that I saw in issues of Harper's Bazaar and Vogue at the Benson Ford Research Center. And Figo Weiss did attempt to have an evaluation of the tube's authenticity via email with Sandy Schreier, a fashion historian, and she confirmed that it was of the wartime era that it was supposed to represent when it was being used at the Holocaust Memorial Center. Based on that, I determined that it was appropriate to use the wartime era to discern its cultural significance. So when looking at the wartime era, what do all of these women have in common? A woman whose appearance is of the utmost importance, regardless of what job she's doing. I didn't include pictures of housewives or socialites from the era, but it's worth noting that they were the same. Perfect hair, perfect makeup, perfect lipstick. So with the cultural significance, the first thing it's worth pointing out is the continued production during World War II. Now, Great Britain cut cosmetic production by 75%. But in America, cosmetics were considered essential for a woman's well-being, so they were not included on the list of rationed items, despite the fact that many of their ingredients were needed for production of other wartime necessities. In an advertisement from a 1942 issue of Harper's Bazaar, the logos of over 50 cosmetic companies came together with the following statement. In the eventful history of American fashion, our great designers and manufacturers, whose labels are gathered here, have met many challenges, but none more exacting than they are meeting today. For in spite of every problem in production that may arise, it is their job to keep America looking alert and lovely. Just how important this job is, we all know. A woman's appearance is her declaration of her faith in life and her man in victory. A pretty dress is her armor. A charming hat is her symbol. She brandishes her beauty like a sword. The sight of her, millions of her, all over America, well-dressed, well-shod, confident, and gay, is as indispensable to victory as ships and guns and tanks and planes. The labels you see here are pledged to the cause of keeping American women beautiful and men's courage high because of them. Now that quote brings us to the next two points, keeping morale high on the home front and keeping morale high for the men fighting the war. The weaponization of red lipstick made it an icon during World War II, with almost any poster that had a woman on it had her donning a red lip, regardless of if she was going to work in a factory or was enlisted in the military. In the same year as that quote from Harper's Bazaar, Good Housekeeping asked, how do you look when he comes home? Women were expected to maintain a well-groomed appearance because to do anything but would have been detrimental to the war effort. If a woman stopped caring about her appearance, it would have meant that the war effort was suffering. So a woman's time spent making herself beautiful wasn't a waste, but rather her way of saying the United States wouldn't be beaten. And in some ways, maintaining some sort of beauty routine allowed her to still feel feminine while taking on more masculine jobs. So women could do the work asked of them while assuring their men and the nation that the traditional expectations of women hadn't been forgotten. Lipstick also began to take on a patriotic tone in its name rather than one of sex. Elizabeth Arden developed the shade Victory Red. Others were Jeep Red, Commando, and Fighting Red. These colors were specifically inspired by a red color distributed to women serving in the Marine Corps, Montezuma Red. Which then brings us to the use of cosmetics in the military. 
Women in the military were doing more than just maintaining their feminine appearance with cosmetics. They were also allowing the men they served with to experience a connection to the girls and the life they left behind in the States. But wait a second. They were maintaining that connection to the home front for themselves, too. Army nurse Ruth B. Haskell said, As I once told my CO, if I should ever stop using makeup, there would be nothing left of my morale. A fresh application of lipstick, my helmet at a jaunty angle, and I was ready for anything. Females enlisted in the Marine Corps were issued a specific lipstick for them, matching the red trim on their uniform, Montezuma Red, and it came with a matching cream blush and nail polish. In response to the popularity of this red, Elizabeth Arden developed another shade, Victory Red, intended to be a staple during wartime for women, and according to Arden, a tribute to some of the bravest men and women in the world. This bold red lip also allowed women to embrace their individuality and sexuality, just as the suffragettes before them had used cosmetics to do the same. The bold red lip was so clearly artificial that it was considered expressive of a woman's control of her appearance and of herself upon wearing it. While wartime valor was one influence in the industry, this romance and sexuality was not something overlooked. In some ads, women were encouraged, while wearing bold red lipstick, to flirt with officers, because after all, who would flirt with a private when they could have a captain? Embracing this sexuality was seen as a virtue and a vice, something prevalent in American society before and after World War II. The image of a woman as a wholesome and angelic being was juxtaposed with the sexy pinup, as if the average woman had to be both. And efforts by designers to ensure that a woman's uniform in the service was professional and feminine while displaying well-done hair and makeup was not entirely successful, because rumors still circulated that referred to all females in the military as being promiscuous. So women were fighting this battle between embracing their new power and agency, while also fighting the stigma of women who had flaunted that type of independence before them. Meanwhile, on the other side of the world, there were women who were ripped from humanity itself that found lipstick as a way to reclaim their lives and themselves. One particular case of this was at the liberation of the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, and this is why the Holocaust Memorial Center has a tube of lipstick in its collection. When the Royal Army Medical Corps received an order of supplies, it included a case of lipstick, and that was confusing at first, but it was later hailed as a stroke of genius because it turned out that lipstick could boost morale, in some cases making the difference of life and death for these women being liberated. They were no longer just women with a tattooed number on their arm. This lipstick was giving them back their femininity, their individuality, and eventually their humanity. So lastly, we have the interpretation. So what does this object mean today? From a modern perspective, the object itself is disposable and replaceable. And it's worth noting, looking at the ads, that there were very few shades of red and all of the ads only featured white women. Today, such a limited and specifically targeted selection would be the kiss of death for any company, not even just cosmetics. Companies today have to mark into women of every skin tone with every interest. And cosmetics have gone beyond just enhancing a woman's natural beauty. Today, cosmetics are literally every color of the rainbow and marketed towards trends instead of just gender. That's not to say that the traditional tones of the 1940s are gone or that their influence isn't there. One brand in particular, Besame Cosmetics, has embraced making colors from every era. They developed a reproduction of that 1941 Montezuma Red that they call Victory Red. It's packaged in a gold bullet-shaped tube similar to the object that was the focus of this study. Which then brings us to its message. A woman's time spent making herself beautiful is her way of saying the United States wouldn't be beaten? That kind of marketing campaign would be laughable by today's standards. While modern audiences might scoff at that, though, they might actually be more relevant than we think. While beauty preferences have changed, the idea that a woman's appearance is tied to her emotional or mental state is still at play in contemporary culture. Maybe not a reflection of wartime morale, but women are faced with the challenge of ensuring they look put together in order to give the right impression. Lipstick has had a resurgence, too with companies creating lines that allow women or men to paint their lips in almost any color if they wish. But to some, it's still an outdated or matronly thing relegated to their grandmothers who won't leave the house without it. Cosmetics continue to be a symbol of individuality and sexuality, still resulting in judgment, not much unlike the early and mid-20th century. Cosmetics provide a glimpse into the daily life of women, whether it's back then or now. And cosmetics are a very personal statement of style, but they're also evidence of societal expectation. So cosmetics, or specifically lipstick in this study, tell a much larger story than just the brand that they come from.